It's a pleasure for me to be here with you again this evening in our continuing saga of the history of our state. Uh, before I begin, I just want to extend an invitation to any of you that uh, would be interested in joining the Kalamazoo County Historical Society on Monday, December 2nd. Uh, we meet at the Portage District Library at 7 o'clock, and speaking is Tom Dietz, who will be talking about the Kalamazoo Corset Strike of 1912. And so you are, even if you're not a member, you are more than welcome to join us. We meet down in the lower level of the library, and I know Tom has given this talk before, and I know I'm really interested in learning about uh, something that happened in Kalamazoo that you may not be all that familiar with. Well, so as Beth described, this is our ninth um, time that we have been meeting to talk about Michigan history. Uh, the way that I had pulled this program together, there are three parts so far with three sessions in each part. Uh, we started uh, around the beginning of 2018, so we've been spreading this throughout uh, the last two years. Uh, this part that we are dealing with this evening are going to continue where we left off in October. In October, we started the third part of Michigan history, and we delved into automotive history. We had actually started it uh, in technically in May. Uh, we looked at the automotive industry in Michigan and when it really picked up around the end of the 19th into the 20th centuries. Uh, in October, we continued that and looked at uh, General Motors and so many of the people involved with it. We touched on road construction, which became a very big part of the Michigan budget going back over 100 years ago. And then the one event that we included last month was World War I and the impact that that had not only on the automotive industry, but the impact that that had on Michigan in general. And uh, tonight what we will do is we will continue and the plan will be to get into the 1920s, followed by the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, and then get into World War II. So this part of Michigan history will end uh, by, by the end of World War II. What will happen after that? Well, we'll have to see. Um, I'll, I'm going to begin to work on what I call the fourth part of Michigan history, and I will be bringing it here to the library more than likely in the spring of 2020. And exactly how many sessions that works out to be, we'll just have to see, because it's always a challenge when you're dealing with that part of Michigan history, because you don't have the wealth of information, uh, especially books and articles that are out there um, that I'm able to take advantage of for the previous nine sessions we've had. So that's the plan as far as how we're going to bring up and conclude uh, the history of Michigan at that point. Uh, and that will be, as I said, next spring. Um, I brought some books with me, which I will refer to uh, periodically uh, this evening. And uh, also, uh, anyway, anybody have any questions um, as we go through this tonight? Uh, and Beth has promised me we will see, for those of you who have been in programs with me here, uh, this always seems to be this pointer and clicker always doesn't like me. We'll see if it likes me this evening. So we'll see what happens. All right. So the Roaring Twenties. One of the things that we see in Michigan, as I'm sure we see in a lot of states, is the population shift. In the 19th century in Michigan, the majority of people lived on farms or small towns. That began to change by the end, towards the end, probably uh, 1870s, 80s, 90s, as the cities became more industrialized and more companies were coming in there. And the either the agriculture uh, was becoming more mechanized or there were um, the lumbering and the mining didn't need as many workers, so more people were moving into towns. But it's interesting when you see how things have changed just in the 30-year time period from the end of the 19th and into the 20th centuries when you look at this, uh, look at the percentage at this point in time. So when you look at this first statistic, you see that, yes, it goes along with what we had mentioned about even in 1890, uh, the differences between whether or not you were living in a city or living in a farm. But then what happens 30 years later? There is that gradual, maybe, maybe a little accelerated change um, brought on, well, specifically in some cities as Detroit, where the automobile industry is really beginning to grow. 
um, and also other communities too. Uh, so you're beginning to see uh, the change. So from 35 to 65, from 61 to 39. Now this doesn't mean that in the 1920s, agriculture is not an important part of Michigan's economy. They just don't need as many people as what they needed before. And there aren't as many people living on smaller farms as what you see um, later on in the 19th century. I love this photo and I have to tell you how many times I look at this and I still am working on the position of it. Uh, this comes from the Kalamazoo Gazette archives which we have at the uh, WMU Archives and Regional History Collections and it's really good when they have a date. So this is 1925. This is the Bryant paper mill over at the Edison neighborhood. Now I'm still trying to find out the locations. The, you know, when I'm looking at a photo, an aerial photo like this, I'm trying to find the, you know, the landmarks that are going to try to give me a position so I can point out this road and say this is here and this is here, and I still haven't figured it out. I'm assuming, I'm thinking that this might be Old South Burdick, which was later McKinley Elementary on South Burdick Street. I'm thinking, but don't quote me on that. Um, but the reason why I have this here is not to spend them too much time trying to figure out which is which and what direction is this road and that road and maybe one of these days I'll be able to figure it out. Um, this building right here uh, at the uh, Bryant Paper Mill is the one building, it was almost like around Reed Street, uh, that was one of the last buildings to come down. So we'll figure this out. But why I have it here is to show how, why was, did you have that growth in the 1920s or even before then? is because you had the, not only, as I said, the population, so you had neighborhoods that are growing, but you also have the industry. And in Kalamazoo, in Kalamazoo County, and really southwestern Michigan, in the teens and definitely into the 20s, the paper mills are really surging. Um, you know, paper in Kalamazoo gets started in the 1860s. It grows for the next few decades, but then it really takes off then. Our population, for example, how much it grew, uh, between 1900 and 1910, our population grew 60%. A lot of that, yes, is the birth rate, but a lot of that, too, is because of the growth in these industries, not just in the paper industry, but in so many other things that were in Michigan. So that's one thing you're going to see in the 1920s, that population rate is going to grow even more. State and local politics in the 1920s, things are beginning to change in a lot of different ways. Well, the one thing that's not changing is what party is dominating state politics, and that continues to be the Republican Party, um, which began to dominate Michigan politics going back to 1854 with the birth of the Republican Party, and that continued throughout the 19th and into the 20th centuries. So when you look at the various people that are holding political office, 99.9% .9 of the time, they're going to come from the Republican Party. Another thing we have is we have a period of reorganization. And when I say reorganization in the state level, we're talking about departments. Uh, previous to the 1920s, the state government had had 30 separate bureaus and departments. And that was reorganized at this time period to just five departments, agriculture, conservation, labor, public safety, and welfare. Um, so that was really something to go from 30 to 5. I thought it was interesting when you look at this that one of those is conservation, which sort of reflects what was happening in Michigan during the progressive era when there were more steps to do things in conserving um, our environment in a lot of different ways. So state government is being reorganized. We touched on this when we were here in October, and that is in the 1920s, Highways are very big as far as the state beginning to put money in. There was the bill that passed, the federal highway bill, um, there was the Good Roads Bill in 1916 where you had to match what the federal government had. So it was like a 50-50 match. Um, so the state is raising that money and then eventually a uh, constitutional amendment is passed around this time period around, I think it was 1919, that allowed the state to raise money. So as I mentioned, Road building, boy, does that sound familiar. The amount of money for road building is going to be a huge part, I wouldn't say a predominant part of the budget, but definitely a big part of uh, the budget for the state. The other thing we see 
And uh, in an earlier session when we talked about progressivism, we talked about how one of the things that was a progressive step was governments, local governments, taking on a new form of government. And what was considered the new form of government at that time was the city manager commission form of government. Kalamazoo adopted it in 1918. Grand Rapids also adopted it. So there were a number of cities who did that in another, in it, for, for many other reasons, for many reasons. Uh, one of them to streamline it and make it more professional because instead of the mayor being in charge, the city manager is going to be in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. So that's one thing that you see uh, going on in the 1920s. Another thing we see in the 1920s, the economy is great. The economy is booming. And so you would see funding for colleges and universities. And this, I can pretty much tell you, is Western State Normal School, an aerial view. This is taken around 1933. And so many of these buildings now, the OK, so you've got East Hall right here. This middle portion now is part of Heritage Hall. Uh, that was 1905. The gym, where I spent many years with the archives, was 1908. You had the training school that was built around 1912. The science building was built around 1913. But now in the 1920s, you've got the library, which is 1924. Uh, you've got the gym, which is in the 1920s. And then you've got, uh, starting in the 30s, you've got the dorms that are encircling that. So the construction that's going on at Western, when you look at the construction that's going on at other state colleges and universities across the state, a lot of that is happening in the 1920s because of the money that is available at that time to do that. Um, we also have expansion going on in our schools. This is what many people may refer to as Old Central. Uh, technically, it's called the Community Education Center, if you look at the sign. Here we have South Westnage. Here we have Vine Street. Now, this building was built in sections. The first section was this section right here on the south side, the one that is on Westnage and Vine Street. And that was completed around 1913 for the manual training program for the school system. But by the 1920s, the population of high school students had grown so much that they needed to continue the plan for the building. And so between 1922 and 1924, now, the gym had already been completed in 1913, the same time this building was done. But the rest of the building was completed. In the 1920s, there was a huge amount of elementary schools that were built in the area in Kalamazoo. I'm sure the same thing was happening in, a leather, in, a, in other communities. The population was growing. People were spreading out in other neighborhoods. And they need schools. And so uh, I have to say it's very nice the school in my neighborhood, Parkwood Up John, is talking about getting ready for their centennial because Parkwood uh, opened up around 1922. So it's nice for that to happen. The other thing we see in the 1920s, as far as transportation goes, air. And the municipal airport at one time was known as Lindbergh Field, same location where the airport is today, uh, and opened around 1927. And so a lot of other communities are getting things like that. So things are really moving along here in the 1920s. Things are really going along. The other thing, when you look at quality of life, again, I'm using Kalamazoo as an example. So I hope you will pardon me for doing that. Yes? Uh, your picture of the air, is that the one on Kilgore? Um, this is, well, I, don't, I can't tell you specifically where that building was located. But the airport, yeah, was located where the airport is today. Okay. So yeah. OK, let's go back here. So when you look at the area of quality of life, a lot of that was growing. Not only were education growing, um, also quality of life. And so what do we have here in Kalamazoo is a good example. Let's talk about, well, the Kalamazoo Public Library, though, which was around uh, back, started open to the public in 1872. And they're located on this corner right here, where we are right now, on the corner of Rose and South Street. But what happens in the 1920s is the library begins to expand. Uh, the museum got its start in 1881 and was housed in the basement of the library. And in 1927, the library purchases the home next door to the library, which was the Horace Peck home. And that became the site of the Kalamazoo Public Museum. Next to that, over on the corner of, so of South Rose and Lovell Street, was the um, Coffer home. And that was an early home for the library's art department 
and also the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, which begins in 1924. So the museum is expanding, the art, art institute is expanding. So again, quality of life. Kalamazoo Symphony, they're getting ready for their centennial in 2021. They began in 1921. Again, quality of life. Um, I have to say that uh, if you go on to the library and look at the local history webpage with all about Kalamazoo, there's a lot of information there that has been written by individuals about music uh, in Kalamazoo. And a lot of the individuals that were involved with other musical groups that were involved uh, with the Kalamazoo Symphony Orchestra. We had a lot of construction that was built in the 1920s, a lot of new buildings. In fact, I even had done a program here not long ago about the 1920s and the, all the building that was going on, including this building up here, the YWCA. Now, the YWCA got started in 1885, but, and they were in different locations, but by the 1920s, uh, actually before the 1920s, uh, they are beginning to build a home of their own. Uh, we're on South Rose Street. This part of the building is still there. The original 1919 building that's behind here is gone, uh, but that one was built first. And then this front part here was completed around 1923. So a lot of construction going on, a lot of expansion going on, a lot of things that were happening as far as the growth of the community. Another thing that was happening, though, in the 1920s was this. Now, I'm not saying it was just in the 1920s. I think there were things that there was a rise of racial tension even previous to that. But one of the things that is happening is you talk about the Great Migration, uh, the numbers of African Americans that are moving from the South to the North because of the jobs that are presented to them, whether they be in the automotive industry or in other areas. Um, in, and there was uh, also a number of white Southerners that were moving up in this area too. In 1910, the African American population in Detroit was about 6,000. By 1925, just 15 years later, it was 80,000. So there were more moving up here. And as a result, there was segregation. We had segregation. It was not like what you had down south where you had signs in front of drinking fountains and you had Jim Crow law, but you had segregation in here. And so what I refer to it as, and what as not just me, but other people who talk about this talk about de facto segregation. And it was, n it was not as overt as in the south. Where you saw the segregation was in such areas as real estate, as far as where people of color could live. And that would then impact where they were sending their students to go to school. Also in the area of where they could stay if they traveled. And also where they would eat. Those are just some of the areas there. One of the things when you look at real estate is the area of restricted covenants. Uh, there was something called redlining, and I know that there's been a program on this before, so I don't want to spend a lot of time because they went into uh, great detail about it. But redlining was, were areas that where you could either rent or sell to individuals, people of color. Um, and uh, realtors would be penalized if they sold a house in an area not for a person of color. So we had that going on in, in the real estate area. In Detroit, the thing that was happening is that the area that uh, a lot of African Americans were sent to live in was on the east side of Detroit. It was called Black Bottom specifically because of the soil. And it was also known by these two names that you see here, Paradise Valley or Hastings Street. It was not that big of an area. And uh, it did have its community. It did have its own community. It had its own neighborhoods, its own stores, family businesses, schools. It had its own hospital. It had a number of professionals that were practicing in this area uh, in Paradise Valley. But it was very overcrowded. You had 7% of the population squeezed into about 1% of the land available. Um, and so there were people who tried 
to live in other places, specifically in Detroit. And you had the story of Ocean and Gladys Sweet. Now, I think many people didn't really know all that much about the Sweets until Kevin Boyle's book came out. It's called Ark of Justice. Uh, it won the National Book Award a number of years ago. And it talked about the Sweets, because what the Sweets did, um, Gladys really wanted to live outside of Paradise Valley. And so they bought a house on Garland Avenue. Uh, the book goes into great detail and talks about what happened. We're looking at about September of 1925. Um, and what was going on with the organizations called the Neighborhood Associations. The book also talks about other professional individuals. Ocean Suite was a doctor in the area, and there were other professionals who also tried to do the same thing, and that is to move into other areas uh, that were not recognized as areas that African Americans could live in. Um, the thing that happened in this situation was that uh, they felt threatened in the house. Uh, there was a mob of people who were um, not really storming, but throwing rocks and other things. Uh, there were some shots that were fired. Uh, one person was killed um, outside the home. And it resulted in uh, not just one trial, but two trials in Detroit. If you get a chance to read the book, it's, it's an absolutely fascinating story. Um, one of the many things that's really interesting about this are the individuals who are involved. And if the name Clarence Darrow rings a bell, Clarence Darrow, the lawyer, was brought up. Uh, he had just finished with the Scopes trial down in Tennessee. And the NAACP hires him to defend not only Ocean Suite, but the other individuals who were charged with this crime. And uh, it, it's just an absolutely fascinating story. And uh, I will say that, um, well, I don't want to give away the ending, because uh, I want you to read the book. Uh, but the house is still there on Garland Street. Um, the suites, well, unfortunately, uh, Gladys had passed away of tuberculosis. Um, Ocean had the house for a number of years. Uh, but there's a very large historical marker in front of it, and it does get a lot of um, publicity. So uh, if you do get a chance, it's called Ark of Justice by Kevin Boyle. Um, and a uh, very, very interesting, interesting story about that. We also had, yes? I think that by this time, and I, I don't think I can, I'm a, an authority to be able to um, give you a whole lot of details, although, um, as some of you might know, uh, I've got a burgeoning interest in tuberculosis and the way that tuberculosis was treated. By the 1920s, I think it, it still had um, an impact. I'm not sure what the statistics were as far as how many people, for example, would have passed away with tuberculosis. The thing that happened with um, Gladys and she had also been arrested and had spent some time in the jail. And there was um, a feeling that because of the conditions in the jail, um, it had, whether it was it brought it on or perpetuated it in some way or you know what happened with that. Her daughter also died of tuberculosis. But in Kalamazoo at this time, our TB hospital had opened, the county hospital opened up in the teens. Uh, around the time, little well before World War I. Um, certainly not as big as um, the um, uh, tuberculosis hospital that had been on, on, uh, in the West Douglas neighborhood. Coincidentally, the county hospital had also been there. So I think that there were things that people were doing as far as treating it goes, as far as tuberculosis goes, as far as the impact that it had on the population. I don't know if it had such a big impact immediately on the population as the Spanish flu did. And I know that Sharon Ferraro has given her talk here on, no, she has not yet, at the museum. OK. Uh, Sharon Ferraro, who's the historic preservation coordinator for the city of Kalamazoo, has done an extensive amount of research on the influenza epidemic in Kalamazoo. Um, I don't think we had the same thing there, but um, I think I, I don't know if I could answer that question for you, other than to say that 
also in the 1920s in Kalamazoo at least, and I don't want to make a broad statement that this happened throughout the state of Michigan, but I know in Kalamazoo we had um, one sanitarium, that one private sanitarium that started specifically for people with tuberculosis. So we had a couple of institutions that were dealing with it. Um, they may not have been able to do enough to, you know, cure it or deal with it. I don't, so I don't know if that answers, answers it or not. Um, all right. Uh, going along the line of segregated facilities, uh, because that not only people who were African American, but also people who were Jewish, were not allowed to go to certain resorts, you have a lot in the 1920s, because people have the abilities to um, get out and, and enjoy themselves and enjoy the weather. You have also uh, vacation spots in Michigan that are established specifically for people of the Jewish faith or people who are African American. Um, there were vacation spots for African Americans in Allegan, Berrien, Cass, Jackson counties. And in 1912, you had Idlewild, which was probably one of the more prominent uh, spots, which was located near Baldwin, Michigan, 69 miles north of Grand Rapids off M37. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, books, well, there have been some books that have written, been written about this. Uh, it was very popular in the 1920s. There were houses, cottages, stores, uh, a club, um, entertainment. Probably the biggest um, African-American stars would go to Idlewild and perform. Um, Dr. Ben Wilson and Dr. Lou Walker wrote a book about it a number of years ago. Uh, and it existed into the 1950s. Uh, one of the things that you have in South Haven, and this is a postcard view, you have a number of resorts in South Haven that are for people um, of the Jewish faith. Um, so you had that that's going on. Yes? I'm not sure. I haven't been to Baldwin in a long time to know what's there. Yes. Is it in, in Baldwin? All right, thank you. When you talk about racial tension, we also see at this time in the 1920s, not just in Michigan, but throughout the Midwest, the rise of the Ku Klux Klan. There was a rebirth uh, before World War I, and the people that they were against grew from people of color. They were against Jews, immigrants, and Roman Catholics. And by the 1920s, there were 5 million members in the United States. What I have here is I've collected a few images from uh, areas in Michigan. Over here on the left-hand side, we have a group in Hesperia, Michigan. And if you don't know where Hesperia is, I do because my Campfire Girl camp was located near there, so Camp Kiwano. Um, it's located up near White Cloud. Uh, north of Nuego, around north of Nuego, around in that area. So that's Hesperia. Uh, this is Baraga State Park. This is, as you can see with the identification, uh, Grand Rapids. And if I think I'm not mistaken, I think this is Calumet up in the UP. Uh, there's also, there was also photographs taken of a rally that happened in Kalamazoo and Crane Park in the Western Chill neighborhood up in that area. So, um, it became a national organization. Previous to this, in the 19th century, after the Civil War, it was more regional. But now, for a number of factors, it was, it was much, much larger. Uh, there were high numbers in cities like Detroit and in Flint. Uh, in fact, they elected mayors, actually, that were members of the Ku Klux Klan in those two cities. Uh, they also uh, burned crosses um, at City Hall in Detroit. Uh, we will also touch on um, Father Charles Coughlin, who also experienced that. And uh, membership declined a little bit in the 1920s, uh, but they were still um, out there. Um, and uh, I remember years ago when I worked at the Kalamazoo Valley Museum, 
uh, we had a son who brought in his father's KKK robe. And uh, one of the conditions of the gift to the museum was that he did not want it identified anywhere as far as who donated it. So I could certainly understand that. Um, yes. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Also, what people are saying, too, is because we talked about the migration of African Americans coming up into Michigan to take advantage of the jobs. Also, there were a number of Southerners that, white Southerners that were coming up, too. So it made a very volatile mix up in that area there. Um, there was an interesting situation um, with the Clark Historical Library at Central Michigan University, because they had an opportunity. They, I think it was in Nuego County. Um, they they didn't, but um, it was found, so somebody found the membership records of the Ku Klux Klan, I think it was for Nuego County. And the Clark Historical um, Library at Central Michigan uh, wanted them. And there was quite a controversy on campus as to whether or not they should uh, go for these records. And in the end that they did, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it's still within their collection, so the Ku Klux Klan. So when you talk about racial tension, there's a lot of things going on at this time, period. I mentioned Father Coughlin, and in the 1920s, the radio priest became probably one of the most influential people in the United States, living in Royal Oak, Michigan, of all places. Uh, he was born in Canada, came to the United States, and he actually, in, early in his career, served as a priest at St. A's, just down Michigan Avenue. He was there uh, in uh, the early 1920s, I think it was. And then eventually went to Royal Oak, and outside of, which is outside of Detroit, to serve at uh, what later became known as the Shrine of the Little Flower. One of the things that Father Coughlin took advantage of was the new technology of radio. And here's a couple more pictures of him. And down here, if you're familiar with suburban Detroit, if you ever go north on Woodward Avenue and you come to uh, Royal Oak, you will see the shrine, which was built uh, in 1931 and 1936. So he began broadcasting in 1926 on WJR in response to the cross burnings uh, by the KKK that happened on the grounds of his church. It was not, I have to say at that point, this was not the church he had. This came later. Um, and he gave a weekly long, pro, hour-long program. Um, and uh, by 1929, three years later, the new owner of the radio station, and WJR was a big radio station at that time in Detroit, encouraged him to focus on politics, not just religious topics. And in 1930, CBS picked him up, and he went national. And he was critical of um, capitalists. He was anti-communist. Um, uh, when the network wanted to review his scripts before his, his broadcast, he refused, and he funded his own national network. And you know, when you think about the importance of radio, I always find it interesting if those of you who do genealogy and the census of 1930, what one of the questions is that they asked people back then was, did you own a radio? Uh, and so that was something, you know, for whatever reasons that they wanted. Um, he did get a lot into politics. He was so popular, he received 80,000 pieces of mail a week. It was said that they had to build a new post office in Royal Oak just to handle the mail of Father Coughlin. 30 million people listened to him weekly. That's how wide and powerful he was. Um, he was initially pro-FDR and pro-New Deal, because he kept broadcasting into the 1930s. Um, later, though, um, he became disillusioned with FDR, and uh, things began to fall apart for him when he became, uh, formed his own political party, 
uh, his anti-Semitic views came out, and uh, he began to support Hitler and Mussolini. And so his radio career ended uh, right before World War II, and he retired and passed away in the 1970s. But during the 20s and into the 30s, Father Coughlin, as I said, was probably one of, I think, next to later FDR, was one of the most influential people um, in the United States. OK, another thing in the 1920s that's really fun is this the rise of some of the, what I have to say are the jewels, many of the jewels of our state, and that is our state park system. So we sort of combine now the things that we talked about in the last couple of sessions. People now have transportation. They have a way to get places. The other thing we mentioned in October was one of the things that Henry Ford instituted was that five day a week. No working on Sundays anymore. So people now have something called leisure time. And they can get out and about. Uh, some of our first parks, actually, when you look at Mackinac Island, Mackinac Island uh, initially was a national park and then later became a state park in 1895. Um, it, this is something that was just not going on in Michigan. It was going on throughout the United States. And I think hand in hand with the progressivism and, and getting people you know, in conservation, and uh, Stephen Mather, who was the first National Park uh, Service Director, said that he wanted recreational land with an easy access of citizens. So the first official, I have to say, the first official state park is, is yes, Mackinac Island was 1895. But then when we think of the parks that have been created uh, around after World War I, you're looking at Interlochen in 1917. Um, they purchased 200 acres of virgin white pine forest, which formed that park. Now, when you look at donations, the first 59 state parks started with donations. The Dodge Brothers Board of Directors gave 10 pieces of land that became part of state parks. Um, and when you look at a lot of these, for example, um, DH Day, now, you may not be familiar with that name, but if you go up to the Sleeping Bear National Lakeshore, where I spend a lot of my time during the summer off and on, um, a lot of those parks and a lot of that area there would not have been there initially if had it not been for DH Day. Uh, so he is an example right there. You've also got uh, Carrie Mears, who gave 15 acres for the Mears State Park and 25 acres for Silver Lake State Park. Here's some other pictures of early state parks. Now, this is one that you should recognize right away. There's Tequaminen. Here's Grand Haven. And I think this is somewhere in Elger County. I think I don't have the exact location of that. Um, the first superintendent of public parks is P.J. Hoffmaster. He had gone to the Michigan Agricultural College with Genevieve Gillette, and she was a longtime advocate for over 60 years of the state parks. Um, another example of philanthropy is Karen Hartwick who, in honor of her husband, who had died in World War I, donated a very large uh, acreage of land uh, in honor of her husband. Uh, 36 out of our 87 state parks originated in the 1920s. Where we will really then, they built on that during the New Deal. And when you look at um, the 1930s, that's when they really spent a lot of money funding improving those parks. And people agreed. They liked it. In 1922, there were 220,000 visitors to the state park system in Michigan. By 1930, just eight years later, there were over 9 million yearly visitors to parks. So people agreed that that was a good thing to do. Well, another thing that happened in the 1920s was this. Prohibition. Throughout the 19th century, there had been attempts to control alcohol consumption. But in the 19th century, there was more of a focus of temperance rather than prohibition. By the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, things had shifted to more end it all, not just slow it down, but end it all. And it was considered progressive. Um, you know, Henry Ford was a big one uh, in making sure that 
you had prohibition because he wanted to improve the workers that were coming to the Ford Motor Company. In fact, remember, for those of you that attended my session, the idea of the $5 day, which Ford implemented in 1914, I think that's right, 1914, uh, to qualify for that, you had to show that you didn't spend a lot of time out there drinking. You had to control that a lot. So what we have is that um, Michigan became dry, actually, right there. Actually, before then, what you had is counties could choose to decide whether or not they wanted to be dry. So when you look at a map of Michigan throughout the turn of the 20th century, you'd have various counties that would be dry until the whole state did it. Um, actually, they approved it in 1916, and it was effective two years later in 1918. Of course, they were ahead of the United States by one year. However, it has been said that um, in the 1920s, yes, the largest industry in Michigan, number one, was automobiles. Number two was smuggling alcohol. This number, I think, it makes sense when you look at the geography of Michigan and our proximity to Canada that 85% came through Detroit. When you read the information on prohibition, how impossible you're thinking how, you know, to be able to uh, deal with this, um, not only as far as the, the alcohol coming through it, but uh, the place, I mean, there were places where you could consume alcohol. Um, you had either speakeasies or they called them blind pigs. And it was estimated that in Detroit there were close to 3,000 of them around the city. They were all over the place. Uh, there wasn't anything. In fact, there's one of the books that I have up here is a book by Phil Mason. And it's the one book about prohibition. It's called Rum Running and the Roaring Twenties. And uh, that's probably the only one that I, I know of. Now, yes, people found other ways to smuggle. Some of the photos up there. Um, that's a very crafty individual who's gained a little poundage around his waistline. But this wasn't the only way. It was said that people would smuggle alcohol in hot water bottles, baby carriages, overcoats, suitcases, shopping bags, loaves of bread, hidden compartments, eggs. I don't know. I don't know if I should be worried because Sunday I was talking to a young friend of mine who's six. 15, he said, oh, no, he said, that's no problem. I could probably do that. I'm going, I don't want to know if you want to do that or not. <laughs> but there were also tunnels that were available. Um, and also, the Detroit River really worked to the advantage of people trying to do this, especially in the winter. Because when we're talking about the winter in the 1920s, that was when the rivers really froze over. Um, and one of the problems with it, with prohibition, was simply this. It was hard to patrol. It was hard to contain. The state police, the Michigan State Constabulary, which was formed a little before World War I to help during the mining strikes and later were used during World War I to protect our industry, they were the primary people that were supposed to be enforcing this, not only them, but the Coast Guard. But every time they think that they would be able to deal with it, the people would find a way to get it through. And as I have here, you would make a large amount of money um, and not really be penalized. There was a video done for American Experience a number of years ago called Demon Rum. And uh, it was interesting talking to the individuals at that time who actually were involved with either they worked in a speakeasy or they were involved with enforcement or they were young ladies who had gone to speakeasies. And they talked to some individuals in e-course who were south of Detroit and just talked about how much money they would make during smuggling. It was, it was almost impossible to be able to do that. Here are some other images. I love this one of a building in Detroit. I think you know what's falling down. And here you see, uh, in fact, they had footage on this show where you could see these cars, these Model Ts that would be leaving Canada on the frozen Detroit River, and then all of a sudden they would get to the point and you'd have the cars going to the south, to the north. I mean, they just went in all different directions. Uh, and there was nobody there to stop them. Other problems here, we had the gangs that were starting. And 
as was said, so many of the gangs um, were ethnic in nature. And uh, you hear about the Purple Gang in Detroit. They were initially the Jewish. Uh, and then later you had the Italian gangs uh, that were out there. And so the criminal element had entered the fray. It wasn't, they weren't smuggling things in eggs or baby bottles or anything else like that. It was a little harder than that. And the other concern was about that they were finding that there were students, especially they were talk about in the Detroit area, who would be going to school drunk, uh, that they had gotten a hold of alcohol. And there were concerns from people because of illegal um, raids that were being made. So uh, you had a repeal campaign. And uh, these are some women from Birmingham, Michigan, that were involved with the repeal. Michigan was the first state to vote. Uh, I don't think that there was any question there. And it was the first time that you had an amendment that was overturned. Uh, and so there, um, you know, for a lot of different reasons, whether it was crime, uh, but the control of the liquor now was going to be, at least in Michigan, under this group. And they would be uh, getting money to, uh, uh, for the liquor, which, and that was one of the big things, was not just so much, of course, yes, the reduction in crime was going to be big, but the other thing was that, um, that the state was going to be able to recoup some funding uh, through the Liquor Control Commission, which brings us to the next question is, so this was, it was repealed in 1933, so why did we need funding in 1933? Which brings us to our next topic, the Great Depression. The Great Depression. I grew up hearing a lot about this from my parents because this was part of their life and it was an exceedingly important critical part of their lives. Um, in both of my parents' cases, uh, they moved a lot with their families, with their parents. Uh, and uh, getting a job, in fact, I think my grandfather and grandmother one time during the Great Depression uh, got a job with a carnival down south. And my mother was in Chicago with her um, grandmother. But it was a way for them to be able to earn money. So there are many, many uh, stories. And, and I'm sure you, too, have stories that you heard from your parents about what it was like in the Great Depression. Um, I did not sit at the kitchen table and roll my eyes when my parents would talk about things because I, I guess when I was young, I knew that it was bad. When you get older, you realized how challenging it was for them. And, you know, we've, we had depressions before, economic depressions, although, as I say here, they weren't really called depressions, but it was that same sort of concept. And we had them throughout the 19th century. There were some, including this one, 1837, that really had an impact when Michigan first became a state. And we touched on that a number of sessions ago. Um, we touched on this last one after World War I, because that really impacted General Motors. And it was the first time that they went bankrupt. But nothing, nothing was anything like what happened around this time period because of the overreaching um, impact of what this had. Um, it had been building for some time. Uh, there is no one specific reason. It, there were multiple reasons for why this happened. And it did affect everyone across all economic, racial, social, ethnic lines. In Michigan, though, it was devastating, especially in the area of the automobile. Because this had become such a prime mover of our economy. And when you come to the Depression, who can afford a new car? And at that time, by 1929, look at how many people or how many jobs are dependent on the auto industry. And this is 1929. It's a huge amount. And when you look at this, how production went from 3.3 million to 1 million, Oh, now that's 1930-31. That doesn't seem, well, it's, you know, it's still producing one million, but that's a huge drop in employment. Because of that, Michigan was known, unfortunately, for having the largest unemployment rate, the highest unemployment rate. This is rather stark when you see this. The national and Michigan. 
driven almost primarily because of the automobiles, the automobile. So when you're looking at the Great Depression, you're looking at the area of relief. During the 19th and 20th centuries, the attitude about unemployment and poverty was that it was your fault. Uh, it was due to laziness, and um, you know, so you should be able to change yourself. There wasn't this feeling that it was something that was caused by something else. It was caused maybe by something you had done or something that was in your character or anything like that. Um, attitudes may have changed, but still, during the Depression, 14 states said that people on relief could not vote or hold office if you were on any sort of relief. Um, in Flint, before the Great Depression, you needed two taxpayers to endorse you before you qualified for relief. So there was really this stigma if you, were, if you needed any type of relief. There was a real stigma about it. Great Depression certainly changed that. Just about everyone, as I said, was affected. As far as who was, um, who was involved with this, it was the role of local, township, or county governments that would be involved with the delivery of relief, and also private organizations. In Kalamazoo, we had an organization called the Women's Civic Improvement League, and they did what they could to help the people that needed it, that needed the aid. And cities did spend funds, but the amount of money that they spent kept increasing as the Depression got deeper and deeper. So Kalamazoo in 1930 spent $50,000 on relief. By 1932, it was 32% of the budget. Before the Depression, it was 4%. Grand Rapids in 1930 spent 33% of their budget for relief. Detroit, um, just to show you how unemployment is happening, happening so quickly, uh, by September 25th of 1930, there were 20,000 people who were unemployed by, uh, or receiving, excuse me, receiving relief, about 20,000. Four days later, it was up to 75,000. So it just kept increasing. Detroit at one time had 66% of their workers either partly or totally out of work. 66%. So government was trying as best they could. Um, the federal government in the early years of the Depression um, had an organization called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that would give loans to states. And Michigan got a certain amount of loans to help them. In Detroit, um, the Mayor's Commission on Unemployment had veterans and men with dependents sell apples which I've, I find absolutely astonishing because by 1930, they had 150 men selling apples. I'm thinking, who are they selling apples to? At one time, they had up to 700 people selling apples. But at least it was something that you were doing. Um, companies were stepping in. The Fisher Body Plants um, were providing, opening up their plants for um, lodging houses. There were a number of thrift gardens and clothing drives and free medical care and private donations. James Cousins, who was an early um, investor in the Ford Motor Company and later worked for Henry Ford and then got out of it, donated hundreds of thousands of dollars for relief. Uh, Detroit was declared by the US Census as one of the hardest hit cities. They had over 225,000 people unemployed. Uh, so there was something that really needed to be done. A lot of communities did this with the relief. They gave people scrip. I don't know if that name sounds familiar. I see a lot of heads going yes, and it's something that I'm also hearing about these days, the issue of scrip. Because it's one thing to get people to work, but you want to give them something. And in this case, what they would do is they would pay able-bodied men to work, and they would pay them in scrip, and then they could use that scrip to exchange it for other things. So in Kalamazoo, men on relief had to work. They built storm sewers, improved Millen Park and other parks. They straightened riverbeds. So you can see there's a lot of municipal projects that they're working on, and they're being paid in scrip. Now, this person right here, George Welsh, who was the city manager of Grand Rapids, um, was really known for what he did. He did hire 
they hired the city of Grand Rapids hired unemployed married men at 50 cents an hour. Now that is 50 cents in scrip. They had as many as 60 different municipal projects around the city, shoveling snow, repairing roads, uh, building playgrounds. Um, they used whatever equipment that the city had. They didn't go out and buy any new equipment. Uh, at one time, they had about 60,000 men that were working on projects. And what they could do with that script is they could take it to the municipal store, and you could buy food. And uh, Walsh, Welsh, excuse me, George Welsh would go, and they, the city would go and try to find, you know, a lot of potatoes, so you could buy that. Um, they also gave free milk away. Uh, the other thing was you could also pay your utility bills in scrip because the utilities were, were owned by the city at that time. So there was this thing about, yes, we're going to have you work, but we're going to reward you for that work, and you will be able to spend it. Uh, teachers, in some cases, were paid in scrip uh, in various school systems. Things began to change with the election of 1932. And politically, Michigan is now shifting as not only Michigan, but the United States, uh, from a Republican to more of Democrat. You have the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who won about 60% of the Michigan vote. Um, one of the first things that uh, Franklin Roosevelt did after he was inaugurated is he closed the banks. Uh, Dwight Waldo, president of the Western State Teachers College, uh, made a trip to Lansing so he could personally get the money to pay the teachers. Um, the thing that FDR instituted was a change in the way that relief is delivered, which impacts the country today. On the state level, we also had a Democratic governor elected named William Comstock. He was the first Democrat in a very, very long time. He also ordered the state banks closed. And one of the things, one of the big things that happened under his administration, one of the first big things that happened, up to this point, the state was dependent on property taxes to pay for services throughout the state. There was a shift with that. And so in 1933, Michigan instituted the first sales tax. It was 3%, and it was supposed to be used primarily for relief. Uh, that year, they raised $34 million on the sales tax. And, and at that time, it was very uh, needed because by 1933, 640,000 Michigan residents were on relief because of the Depression. So things were beginning to change. So when I talked about uh, how relief has now changed, now it's primarily the role of the federal government. The state will be involved in such way, but the federal government now plays this role not only in giving money, but setting up the rules as far as how you could, the rules and regulations as how you could qualify for this relief. Um, it was no longer a local matter. There was now, as I said here, a hierarchy where you have the, the federal government dealing with the states or the counties, and so it was coming down that way. And also, too, no more of this public shaming at that time, at this time. It was their right to receive that. So what we have is something that you probably learned in classes or read about it, and that, of course, is the New Deal. And these are just some of the acronyms on the left-hand side for some of the programs that we'll talk about, some of them. So you've got a number between 1933 and 1938, you had 19 different acts, agencies, um, all which in some way had to deal with relief. Um, also, you had uh, the Indian Reorganization Act, which allowed Native Americans to um, have procedures for how they could govern themselves. That happened under the New Deal. Um, they also, Native Americans, were able to take advantage of some of the programs, including the, the WPA, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And what did some of these have in common? What did not all of them, but the majority of them have in common? And that is the idea of putting people to work, putting people to work. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, even the names of some of them had those wonderful words. 
So you've got works right up here and works here and works progress. So big emphasis on that. Let's see. I want to go back here. Um, so the Civil Works Administration, you know, was creating temporary jobs, mainly construction jobs. Um, Kalamazoo received almost immediately $400,000 for city projects that uh, doing the same sort of things that they were doing before for script, they're now getting paid in money. Uh, public Works Administration, same sort of thing. You've got constructions of public buildings, dams, courthouses, libraries. And then the Works Progress Administration, where unemployed are giving work doing a lot of different things, improving streets before, like what we said before, improving airport runways, like we saw that picture of the Kalamazoo Municipal Airport, improving cemeteries, zoos, golf courses, and also employing, under the WPA, a number of artists, actors, and writers, peoples in li people in libraries and museums. Couple examples. This building right here, this does not look like what it looks like now. This is the Civic Auditorium in Grand Rapids. It was built in 1932 with fund from the Public Works Administration. Um, most of this is gone, and uh, it's, uh, I think, probably just about the still there up to this area. The lobby area is still around. Uh, the auditorium that was renamed the Welsh Auditorium was taken down, so that's still there. Then we've got our Kalamazoo County Courthouse, which was built in 1937 on Courthouse Square. And they also used Public Works Administration money to build that. Now, they just, it just wasn't PWA money. The voters of Kalamazoo County approved uh, an amount of money for the construction of that building. Uh, so those are some examples right there. As far as Kalamazoo, some other buildings that were built as a result of funding that was received as a result of the New Deal this building up on the left-hand side is the Douglas Community Association, uh, which is on Ransom Street. That opened up in 1940. That was built with funds from the New Deal, from the PWA. Um, over here on the right-hand side, we have the Harold Upjohn School, part of Parkwood Upjohn Elementary. Um, there were local donors for this building, but they also received money from the Public Works Administration to build the school. And then down here, the improvements in parks. Here's the pool from Millen Park. Uh, and they also received money. And there were a lot of other projects like that that got funded throughout the state of Michigan. As far as people who were employed through the Works Progress Administration, please excuse me while I use the example of Mamie Austin. Uh, Mamie Austin had come to Kalamazoo with her family. And her father was a photographer. And he, uh, he had a studio. Uh, she worked at the studio, but closed it during the Great Depression, who's getting their portraits done. And uh, she was employed at the Kalamazoo Public Library through the Works Progress Administration. Uh, KPL hired workers through this program and through the Federal Emergency Relief Agency and eventually the National Youth Administration. There were a number of projects that they did here at the library through the WPA. Um, Mamie worked through what was called the WPA Women's Project. Uh, between 1935 and 1943, 8.5 million people in the United States were working and being funded by the WPA. The average salary was about $41 a month. Uh, the WPA supplied wages. Uh, the institution provided the jobs. And 13.5% of the WPA workers were women whose average age was 40. So at, in the library, uh, the WPA workers produced catalog cards. They staffed school libraries. They did mending. Uh, the museum, they recorded the museum collections. Uh, but what um, Mamie did is Mamie worked in the art department. She did a lot of different things. Part of what she did, too, is she made visits to schools. She was known as the movie lady uh, and fired up that 16 millimeter projector. Uh, to show the movies. She did that. But another thing that she did during, uh, as an employee of the WPA, that was such a valuable service, is between 1936 and into 1943, uh, she took photographs of Kalamazoo, which were then developed, mounted, and loaned out in the art department. These are currently part of the um, collection of the local history room. 
And they are online, so you can see all of Mamie's photographs. And Mamie has been a favorite of mine, as far as a photographer goes, because of her eye and her ability. I've, one of my favorite photographs is this one right here, the Kalamazoo Stove Company. Uh, the thing she did during this time period is she did schools, parks, industry, businesses, institutions. It's a wonderful record of what Kalamazoo was like in the 1930s and into the 1940s. Um, it's a wonderful collection of photos. So this right up here is the municipal market, not the farmer's market that you know now, but on Mill Street, which is where they were before they moved to the current market on Bank Street in the Edison neighborhood. And this one down below here is a building called the Infant Welfare Station that was sort of at the intersection of Gull Road and Harrison. There's a triangular piece of land near where the, just down from where the food co-op is and maybe across the street from where McKenzie's Bakery is located. And it was a privately run institution, but it was a place where women could go and get advice on raising their children, raising their babies. Mamie had, I mean, there's hundreds of photographs that Mamie took as a result of being funded by the WPA. So there are so many other projects out there that um, people were involved with. Uh, this was Crane Park photograph that she took with the gardens, which were put in Crane Park as a result of money received through the New Deal to demonstrate to people um, what you could do in your garden. Okay, this is not Kalamazoo, I know this, okay? San Francisco. But another example I like when you look at the WPA, this is Coit Tower, and Coit Tower was built between 1932 and 1933. The tower is very interesting, the views at the top are fantastic. But what also is interesting are the murals on the inside of Coit Tower. Um, those were also funded by, um, now this one was funded by the PWA, and they had 25 artists and faculty that were paid $25 to $45 a week, um, and they've recently been restored. So that's just another fine example, a wonderful example of the WPA. Another program in the New Deal that has, is really considered to be quite a success is the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC. It employed men between the ages of 17 and 25. It was known as Roosevelt's Tree Army. It was operated by the Departments of Agriculture, War, and Interior. It housed, clothed, fed, and organized camps. The, men were pay the young men were paid $30 a month, 22 of which they had to send home to their mothers, to their parents. And um, they got all the supplies. Michigan probably had some of the larger, we had a total of 61 camps in Michigan, both in the Lower Peninsula and Upper Peninsula, that uh, totaled of about 11,000 men. We also had camps um, for African Americans, we also had separate camps for Native Americans and World War I veterans. Now there is a long, long list of jobs that these young men did all in the forestry area, whether it is improving state parks or planting trees or, or stocking rivers with fish. Um, the list goes on and on and on. They also created buildings um, at Hartwick Pines and uh, there is a lumbering museum there and the buildings were built by the CCC. Um, there, were also, there was also an educational component, so for many of these men, they completed eighth grade, they get their high school diploma, in some cases they got training, um, and uh, the program ended in 1942, and there were a total of 103,000 men that served in the CCC, and at one time there was a museum at Higgins Lake, I'm not sure if it's still there or not, but the Civilian Conservation Corps. Well, it looks like I'm not going to make it through World War II tonight, but that's okay because you know who won, so you're not going to be sitting on your, you know, sitting waiting apprehensively as far as who won. But there is one more topic that I'd like to cover this evening, and it deals still, we're still in the Great Depression, but that is labor and the organization of unions. So in uh, the early 19th and 20th centuries, we had a lot of craft unions. Uh, in 1886, there was an attempt to form a national organization, um, but you had a challenge between uh, craft versus industrial workers, skilled versus unskilled, 
And um, so you had a difficulty in, in how you're going to organize, for example, auto workers. Because what used to be a skilled or semi-skilled profession had become unskilled. So here we have a photo. Here we have Mr. Ford on the right-hand side. And this is Harry Bennett, who was an employee of his um, and uh, was in charge of, shall we say, squashing unions. Anyway, so as far as organizing auto workers into unions, uh, these were some of the problems as far as being able to create unions. And that was, yes, it was a high wage industry initially. Uh, Michigan became a center for the automotive industry because it was known as initially open shop, which would be no unions. You had all these different measures, whether they were the $5 day or educational programs that other companies prov provided and other services. Uh, they were done for a lot of different reasons, but primarily, too, to discourage unionization and also people being intimidated. Uh, between 1934 and 1936, General Motors had spent nearly a million dollars to stop unions. Um, Bennett, over here on the left-hand side, uh, was in charge of what was called the Ford Service Department. And uh, there were about 3,000 to 8,000 uniformed and over undercovered men that would go throughout the plant to try to stifle any here. You know, if they heard anything, anybody was going to start um, going for unionization, they were going to be dealing with that. Things, though, begin to change during the Great Depression. There was a period of time um, towards the middle to the late part of the Great Depression, so more in like the, the mid-1930s, um, where there were things that were happening that the workers did not like very much. For example, seasonal layoffs where you'd have workers for a certain period of time. They would not be working, but they would not have any support at that time, any, any sort of monetary support for those layoffs. But there were two acts that were passed within that New Deal administration that were going to help them. Um, the, National Relief, the National Recovery Administration, which initially passed not long after Franklin Roosevelt was president. Uh, Section 7A. Guaranteed collective bargaining, established maximum hours, protection for labor, and it was but it was declared unconstitutional for a number of reasons. But the act that really gave them some power was this one right here, the Wagner Act of 1935. And that gave um, labor organizations the power, uh, or I should say it gave workers the power if they wanted to be unionized in some way for what steps they needed to take um, which for them, I think, they thought, thought was a step in the right direction. There were also some organizations that were created. This one right here, the top one, the UAW, which was very important for what we needed, and also the Committee of Industrial Organizations, or the CIO. The AFL had already been created, but the AFL was more for skilled workers. The CIO was more for unskilled workers. So you had organizations um, that could do what they could do. Um, so by 1936, workers realized that they needed to be aggressive to get the employers to recognize them. And so the way that they turned was the sit-down strike. Uh, between 1936 and 1937, about 500,000 workers used this tactic, not just in industry, but also in the service sector. Um, the first one is January of 1936 in Akron, um, the Akron Firestone plant. And there were reasons for why you might want to go this way. You're sitting down. Nobody else can come in and use that equipment. You've got it locked down. How are you going to bring in what are called scabs to work if people are there? Um, you want to force the owners, and you'd only need a small number of people. You wouldn't need everybody to participate. Um, so you have a small number to force them to negotiate. And so what they decided to do, what the UAW decided to do, is to go for this company first. By 1936, look at that number. We talked about Alfred Sloan over here on the right-hand side, who's the head of General Motors at the time. And what had happened 
um, as they overtook Ford Motor Company, which had been number one for so many years. And so they were the largest one out there. And what a one to go after. So they were also encouraged by not only the election, the re-election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1936, but the election of the Democrat Frank Murphy as the governor of the state of Michigan. Uh, Murphy had been the judge during the Ocean Suite case. He had also been the mayor of Detroit. In addition, there had been sit-down strikes in other locations in the United States. So they were ready to go. For General Motors, it was Flint. And specifically, it was um, Fisher Body number two. There, were a, there was a rumor that the dyes for, were being moved out. And these two plants, Fisher Body one and Fisher Body two, produced all the bodies for Cadillac, Buick, Oldsmobile, and Pontiac. So these two plants were key. And so the workers took it over during this month and immediately idled 136,000 workers, General Motors. And uh, they were very well organized. The workers were very well organized as far as exercise, defense, surveillance, uh, cleaning up. Everybody was assigned tasks on what to do. Um, they got a court, GM got a court order, but uh, Murphy refused to uh, comply. And within a week, 13 other plants went on strike. And within two weeks, all 69 General Motors plants had to close. That happened. So whereas uh, in February of 1936, they were producing 53,000 cars a week in December, before these plants closed, they were producing 1,500. They had a lot of support from the women, the women's auxiliary, who would march, bring food, bring other support uh, to the workers. And we also have children that also supported their fathers who were striking. Uh, during the strike, you had uh, things happen like what was called the Battle of the Running Bulls, where it happened at Fisher Body 2. Uh, the police were ready to storm, but the National Guard, who are marching here out of a school in Flint, were there to keep the peace. And uh, slowly by the Running Bulls, Battle of the Running Bulls was in January of 1937. So this had been going on for at least four weeks already. It was getting into the fifth week. And uh, so by that time, by, the t by February of 1937, um, the UAW was triumphant. Uh, G the FDR had ordered GM to the bargaining table, and they entered negotiations. They came to an agreement. It was a very simple agreement, as I said here, one page. Uh, the UAW is the sole bargaining agent. Um, all the people got their jobs back. There was a modest wage increase, um, a very loose grievance process that was established. But with GM, I think they really had to do this. Uh, during that time, between December, the end of December, and the beginning of February, um, they estimated that they lost production of about 280,000 cars, which turned out to be about $175 million that they lost, that General Motors lost. So the workers had successfully defeated the nation's largest employer, and they showed the power of the sit-down strike. Uh, there was a rise of union membership, but eventually, about uh, two years later, uh, the Supreme Court had ruled that sit-down strikes were illegal. And so you really didn't, after 1939, you didn't see that being used. This is the, a web page to a very interesting site, if you're interested. It's called um, the, um, it's an audio gallery, the Flint sit-down strike. This was done a number of years ago, and there were still quite a number of people who experienced the sit-down strike in a lot of different ways who are still there. And uh, if you go online and just type in Flint, Flint Sit Down Strike, this one is currently hosted by MSU. Um, and it's um, right, it's msu.edu. But um, what's nice is that they recorded a lot of these individuals who participated in the sit down strike. So this is the main page right there. And they have different areas. 
And there's a link there that will say, like, if you want to hear about the strike, you press that in there. And then there's a number of people that you can click on and hear their first person oral history about the strike. And so it's a really, really nice website. Another thing that they have in Flint, they have the UAW Sit Downers Monuments and Memorial Park. This was designed by Janice Trimp, and it was dedicated on Labor Day in 2003. And so they have a, a series of, in fact, recreations of some of those photographs that we saw. Here we have workers who are sitting down at this point. Uh, there's that iconic picture of the young boy holding the picket sign. Let's go back. So they are paying tribute to that um, in uh, Flint. Subsequently, then other auto into all the all, uh, other auto companies also participated, or they had strikes. You had Chrysler. So the UAW settles with uh, GM in February, and the next month they go at Chrysler. Um, there was, at this point in time, in 1937, they could still do sit-down strikes. And so they did have a sit-down strike. Um, Chrysler agreed, as you can see, like within a month, they agreed and signed a contract with the UAW. Um, and uh, people were beginning to take notice. The New York Times said about Michigan, isn't that uneasy peninsula between the lakes, the place where all the trouble that affects this nation started? The big one was the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford did not want to budge. Um, Ford had stepped down as president. His son Edsel had come in. But Ford was still, had very strong control of the company. And here's again another photo of Ford. And then you've got the same photo we had with Harry Bennett on the left-hand side. I had mentioned that Henry Ford had employed a number of African Americans at the Ford Motor Company. And one of the reasons why it has been said he did that is because he wanted them to remain loyal. There were attempts in 1937 which led to unionize, which led to what is called the Battle of the Overpass. And uh, it was about one month after Chrysler. And unfortunately for Ford, there was a photographer from the Detroit News who was there taking pictures. And in this collection of individuals from the UAW is an individual right here who was very prominent with the UAW at this time and for many years, and that's uh, Walter Ruther right here. Walter Ruther uh, was born in West Virginia. He and his brothers came to Michigan to work at Ford, became heavily involved with the United Auto Workers, and was president for over 20 plus years, 25, close to 24 years. And the thing that Ruther did is that he felt that the union was just not for workers, but to promote human, civil, and social justice causes, which they did in the 60s and the 70s. But let's get back to the Battle of the Overpass. So the members of the UAW wanted to hand out pamphlets at the Overpass at the Rouge, and the Ford Service Department was there. And what was recorded then were beatings that took place of the UAW members by the Ford Service Department. And the resulting photographs were this. And this was probably one of the more iconic photographs with Walter Ruther on the right-hand side. And this is Richard Frankenstein from the UAW. The photographer from the Detroit News who took pictures, um, the Ford Service Department uh, forced him to give up the plates what they didn't know is he gave them the wrong plates, which is the reason why these images survived. Now, that was 1937. Um, later on, they did strike Ford, but they weren't able to strike Ford until right around um, 1941. So it was before World War II. Between 1937 and 1941, though, there was a lot of attempts to unionize Ford. And between that four-year time period, 4,000 employees at Ford were fired for their involvement with the union. So they were, try they were trying anything to stop it from happening. The strike began at the beginning of April. Um, 85,000 workers were idle. The thing about, the Af about people, workers who were African-American, 
he did not get 100% loyalty from them. Of the 10,000 African American workers that worked for Henry Ford, only about 1,500 stayed and crossed the picket line. So this one settled very quickly. Ford accepted the union, surprisingly, within six days. Um, and by April 14th, they were back to work. Um, and uh, Ford signed the contract with the UAW um, by June. Um, exactly what the reasons were for why Ford settled so quickly, he gives credit to his wife, Clara. Says that uh, she was the peace person of the time. She was able to find peace. But probably one of the reasons was this, um, not only about what labor unrest could do, but at this point, it's 1941. There's a lot of contracts out there for war work. And Ford was really concerned about what the federal government might be able to do, because the, the government was threatening to revoke those contracts unless Ford improved their policies towards labor. And uh, the UAW, by 1945, uh, four years uh, later, after the Ford Motor Company, had a million members. And they were one of the largest unions for about the next 20 years. So definitely a big change in um, Michigan when it comes to unionization. All right, so we are going to end there tonight. When we pick it up again, we will start with World War II and then continue on with the changes that have happened in Michigan after that time period. Does anybody have any questions at this point? All right, well, thank you very much for joining me this evening.